Now, one more word of instruction, and this is something I should have said back when we started this series. Please don't leave in the middle of a message. You're going, why are you telling us that now? Well, for the past five weeks, I have pretty much depressed the socks off of you in the first half of every one of these Ecclesiastes messages. It's been down, it's been depressing, and we're just really following what the, the writer in Ecclesiastes has gone through. And it's not been a great encouragement to us, but if you stick through that to get to the second half of the message, then it gets turned around. So I would shudder to think that some of you would get halfway through one of these messages and then leave and, and not know the good part that's supposed to follow. So um, that's just my word of encouragement with that, okay? Do I need to wake you up now that the lights have been off this long? We're in part five today of our series that we've entitled Nothing But Smoke. And next week, we're going to jump to the end of the book. And uh, we may come back and finish off the book of Ecclesiastes later on in the year. But I'm pretty excited about this passage today. These are probably the most famous of the verses in Ecclesiastes. Even if you have never read the book, you have probably heard these verses. So if you would, I'm going to ask you to stand. Old fashioned today. Stand out of reverence for reading the word of God. Did you grow up in a church like that? I did. Used to do that in church when I was growing up. Okay, we're going old school today. Uh, it'll be on the screen in front of me so that you don't, you can look at your Bible if you want to look in the dark. I'm amazed at what some of you can do in the dark. That, that was funny. That was, okay, Ecclesiastes chapter three, beginning in verse one. For everything there is a season a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be quiet and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do people really get for all their hard work? I have seen the burden God has placed on us all. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. Just got to pause right there. Do you all remember a, a song from years ago, Everything is Beautiful, Ray Stevens? That's what he was basing that on that line there. Verse 11, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. So I concluded that there is nothing better than to be happy and enjoy yourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for these are gifts from God. And I know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added to it or taken from it. God's purpose is that people should fear him. What is happening now has happened before, and what will happen in the future has happened before, because God makes the same things happen over and over again. You can be seated, but what? I didn't hear any of you screaming. We can go, lights can come back on now. Thank you so much for letting me share that with you. Yeah, that was a group called The Birds. And I don't know if you are into rock and roll history or not, but the guy that was on this far side, the one that kind of looked like he didn't know what he was singing when he first started singing. Yeah, that guy's name is David Crosby. 
And some of you remember that name from Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, and that was back in the day. This was over 50 years ago. And what show was it on? Ed Sullivan. I ate lunch with some teenagers on Sunday, and they had never even heard of the Ed Sullivan show. But uh, this was kind of like the pinnacle. I mean, if you got to play on the Sullivan show, that's where the Beatles were first introduced to America. And, you know, you heard some of the screaming, and that's only because they had learned how to tune most of it out. Uh, but there was a lot going on there. But I thought you might enjoy seeing what we had done with that particular song. Um, and my mind just went blank on who wrote that song. Uh, Pete Seeger. I don't know if any of you remember Pete Seeger. This was back when folk music was really folksy. Yeah, okay, that's who wrote that song. But he had help with the words. Yeah, quite a, quite a bit there, yeah. So, uh, and if you go out and do some searching on YouTube, you'll find out that all kinds of different people performed that song, recorded it, and made money off of it. I don't know that they gave God his cut. Uh, I don't know, but it's a possibility. But I thought you might enjoy a little bit of that. Uh, I want to move on into this message. I've shared this particular quote with you several times already. But C.S. Lewis said this, and you may remember this. He said, human history is the long, terrible story of humans trying to find something other than God which will make them happy. Wow. That, that quote is basically the book of Ecclesiastes in a nutshell. Ecclesiastes is a bold and honest look at the ways we try to find happiness and we try to find meaning and purpose in life, but we're trying to do it without God. The writer of Ecclesiastes makes no doubt about it. He is searching. He is on the hunt. Now, he has not secluded himself away from the world to do this. Instead, he is slugging his way through life. He's on the ground, desperately looking for something that will make him feel alive, something that will satisfy. And to that end, I don't think we are all that different. And what he concludes over and over and over again is that everything and everyone in this world will at some point or time disappoint you and fail you. He says it's like, and this is a phrase we've been learning every week, he says it's like chasing the wind. Chasing after the wind. Something that, that we really can never catch. Something that we're going to chase our entire lives. Now, we've looked over the past few weeks at how the teacher in this book tried to find life apart from God. He tried to find it in pleasure. He tried to find it in wisdom and in accomplishments. And we've learned that every one of those avenues left him high and dry, did not satisfy him. In the verses that we just read today, the entire subject is about time. But don't let that confuse you because what he's really getting at in this passage is control. Do you like to be in control? Don't lie. Oh yeah, yeah. These verses that we read are among the most popular and in the opinion of the people that I studied after, these are also among the most misunderstood verses in Ecclesiastes. You may have heard that passage read or at least part of it at a funeral. They're often read as a way to bring comfort to the grieving family members. And while I do believe there's a sense of comfort in these verses, they are actually intended to show us the haunting, uncontrollable nature of time. How do you do with time? Time ever disappoint you? Time ever really let you down? Find it hard to control time? Exactly. Professor Peter Kreeft from Boston College wrote these words, and it'll be on the screen. He says, time is a river that takes from us everything it gives us. Is there progress? Does time go anywhere? Are we in a story? Not if observation under the sun tells us the truth about time. 
for such observation under the sun sees only cycles, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. What gain has the worker from his toil? Under the sun, there is no good news. Progress is a myth. Pretty heavy stuff there. At least something for you to think about. So the writer of Ecclesiastes wants us to see that life under the sun, which we've come to understand when he says that, he's talking about life without God, is untamable. It's uncontrollable. He says seasons come and seasons go. All of us live. And yes, whether we want to face it or not, all of us are going to die. Life is an uncontrollable mix of good times and bad times. Good days and bad days. Peaks and valleys. Now I have to confess that I think about time more now than I ever have. It probably means that I'm getting older. You just passed up a wonderful opportunity for a Father's Day gift to me. Thank you. So that's not going to happen. I, I know that I've gotten more self-reflective and more self-aware as I get older. It seems like just yesterday that my kids, Dion and Drew, were little bitty tykes. I remember picking them up. I remember them reaching for me. Uh, I remember holding them. They wanted me to go outside and play baseball or football or whatever kind of ball they were into at that point. They wanted Alita to read stories to them. And it seems just like yesterday. And if I do go back through an old photo album, some of those pictures leave me in kind of a pool of feelings these days. Alita and I were their chief source of help and comfort and safety. And I really have nothing but the sweetest memories of those days, which means, yes, I'm willing to push aside all of the other things that happened. And yes, as parents, we were sleep-deprived, frazzled, and worn out. But as we look back at those moments, we find ourselves wishing that we could go back and savor every one of those just a little bit more. I am so grateful that I got to experience those days. But those days are over. My kids are grown. There are now three grandchildren that I get to spoil, all of whom are convinced that their grandpa is crazy. <laughs> now, my kids, my grown kids, still look to me for help and comfort but they do so in a very different way than they did when they were little. I miss those days, I really do. But there's no going back. Sweet memories are both a blessing and a curse. I also think about how much I love them in this season of life. These days, the precious things that I get to experience with the precious people that I love in this season of life. And then it dawned on me about how these days will one day be as far away as those days are to me now. Time passes by quickly. You see why this is called the depressing part of the sermon? Yeah, because we're all feeling really old and decrepit about now. Thank you. I appreciate that. The sun rises and the sun sets. How often? Every 24 hours. It happens. My oldest grandchild is going to be 15 this fall. It, it, it just seems like he was born yesterday, you know? In fact, we've got a baby picture in our bedroom still hanging in there of when we were holding him in the hospital. I've learned a lot about slowing down. Probably not as much as I need to learn. I've learned a lot about how to savor time, savor the moment, appreciate the time, I've learned, hopefully, how to not take minutes for granted. But time continues to pass, and I can't stop it. No matter how much I try to slow it down. 
no matter how much I deeply savor those moments, they pass. Can't stop it. And for some reason, that plays with my emotions these days. Now, I'm not trying to bring you down. It's going to get better, okay? I'm just letting you know it's going to get better. But all of this is a little scary as well because it continues to cause me to ask questions like, what am I missing? What did I forget to do? What should I be doing? How should I be spending my time? Are there opportunities out there that are passing me by and I don't even recognize them? Now, here's one of those deep statements. It's not going to be on the screen, but you think this one through. It's been said that the root of control is fear. The root of control is fear. And I think that makes sense. Whether we like to admit it or not, I'll just say for myself, I depend on my ability to control things to make me feel safe. And I don't think it's just me. I think we all do that, whether we realize it or not. We want a certain amount of control in our lives. And that's what helps us to feel better about things. And nothing confronts our inability to control things like the passing of time. We might think that we're doing a pretty good job of controlling this or controlling that. And then time passes. And as it passes, it reminds us that we are not in control of anything. No matter how much I try to control it, I'm getting older. My body gets weaker. I got a shot this week. One of those nice steroid shots, right? Right up here where the surgery was, right where they cut those muscles that didn't ever heal. And it's like, you know what? Um... My body gets weaker. And you ready for a real downer? One day I'm going to die. Yeah, it's going to happen. It's going to happen to you too. And I know you don't want to hear that. And no matter how much I try to control it, 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 it just doesn't matter how hard I work at it or how much I save. Think of all the money that you save that is going to be spent by either you or those that you're going to leave it to can't take it with you. So trying to calm our fears by controlling times and seasons and outcomes is a game we all eventually lose. Death comes for us all. We're not out of the depressing part yet, so stay with me, okay? In 1996, which I realize we have people in the room that weren't even born yet, so um, Dr. Billy Graham was being awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, which is about the highest, that's the highest civilian medal that can be given in our country. It was going to be given in the Capitol Rotunda. And you've seen pictures over the years of the Capitol Rotunda. It's a big circular room, and around the back side of the room, all the way around, are these marble busts of the heads of leaders. And... Um, When it was his turn to speak, Dr. Graham stood up and he was characteristically short and to the point. He said to everybody that was gathered, he says, I want you, nope, you can take that one off because that's not my quote, thank you. We're gonna have a Dr. Billy Graham quote here in a minute so you can get ready for that. But here's what he said to everybody that was gathered in the rotunda. He said, I want you to look at all of the busts in this room, whether they were Democrats or Republicans, but whatever issues they stood for, they all have one thing in common. They're all dead. Yeah. Now, it seems so obvious, right? But for some reason, it hit that room like a ton of bricks. I said you could have heard a pin drop. That's what the writer of Ecclesiastes is getting at. If we're counting on our ability to control things... We are building houses on sand. And we're going to be disappointed. I guarantee you we are going to be disappointed in something. One of Dr. Graham's last books that he wrote was entitled Nearing Home. Subtitle was Life, Faith, and Finishing Well. And he speaks quite openly in that book, if you've ever had a chance to read it. He talks about the difficulty of getting old. 
not because he was afraid to die, because he wasn't, but because age magnified the fear of insignificance. He said, and let's go ahead and put the quote back. He said, now that time has taken its toll and I have been relegated to the sidelines, do I matter anymore? I think the older we get, the more common it is for us to ask questions like that. If we're building on our own sense of safety and our own sense of stability and our own sense of self-worth and on things that we can't control, if that's what we're trying to build our lives on, then we are signing up for a lifetime of ongoing disappointment. It all comes back to what the writer of Ecclesiastes identified at the start of the book where we were four weeks ago. He talks about the fear that we all have. The fear that whether we are aware of it or not, there is a fear in each one of us way down deep. We fear nothingness. We fear emptiness. We fear meaninglessness. We fear getting to the end of our lives and asking the question, did any of it matter? And one of the ways we deal with this fear is we try to control time. How do you like it when somebody doesn't live according to your timetable? Some of you are not remembering when you had those teenagers in your house and it was time to go and they had not yet finished in the bathroom. Yeah. We try to control time. We try to slow things down if we're really enjoying the season. Or we try to speed things up if it's been a hard and heavy season. And down deep, we know we can't do that. We know that we can't control time. A writer by the name of Michael Horton said it this way. He said, we don't know what to do with the inevitable death we face under the sun. But by avoiding the question, we deprive ourselves of the comfort that comes from the answer. When we try to avoid thinking about it, which by the way is a great trend in our culture these days. I don't wanna talk about the end. I don't wanna talk about death. We end up, that's what we do. We don't wanna talk about it. Let's, let's talk about something else. And I'm just gonna use this as an example, but nobody wants to talk about funerals these days. In fact, we are using the word funeral less and less and less because it's uncomfortable. We don't wanna talk about death or taking pictures of the slides on the screen. Yeah, yeah. So we change the vernacular. We change the words. Instead of talking about a funeral, let's call it a celebration of life. And I mean no offense to any of you who may have organized a celebration of life, okay? No harm, no foul as far as I'm concerned. But I think it's very insightful to look at even the change in the language over the years. The ways that we try to avoid the inevitable that we know is coming. We don't like to talk about death. I mentioned last week that there are a lot of speakers and leaders out there who are telling us that life is all good. Don't think about the bad stuff. Don't even think about the possibilities. Don't even look at it because all it's gonna do is bring you down and we don't wanna be down, we wanna be up. Think positively, think about your potential because we don't want to think about the other side of that. But the writer of Ecclesiastes is not going to let us get away with that nonsense. Now, what he does here in this passage is he sticks our nose in it. So, now we're making a turn, okay? Are you ready to get in? So, the, the question is, what is the solution? What do we do? We can't control times or seasons or outcomes. We're all going to die one day. I thought about stopping now and turning, having you turn to each other and say, yeah, you're going to die. But I thought, no, 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 no. We're not going to do that. But I think the question that may come to people's minds is, what does it matter anyway? And let's be honest. We all live with a catalog of regrets. We live with that, and the passing of time is painful because of that. So what is the solution? 
What is the answer? But we can't escape the fact that our ability to change things doesn't last. You may be able to change your kids' lives for a very short period of time, but it doesn't last. And the reason why this is so true is because of what our teacher in Ecclesiastes tells us in verse 11. Did you catch this when we went through it? It says, He, God, has planted eternity in the human heart. We've got to focus on this for just a second. He has planted eternity into our hearts. In other words, God has hardwired a sense of forever inside all of us. Life under the sun is not all that there is. And somewhere deep down inside of us, we know it. There's this haunting sense of forever that God has hardwired inside of us. And I'll be honest, that helps me for a variety of reasons. Because when I think about moments lost, when I think about moments past, when I think about times that I can't go back to, let's be honest, who has not wished for a ride in Michael J. Fox's DeLorean so that we could go back in time? Okay? rarely get to use the word DeLorean in a sermon. So I feel that I've accomplished something there. But the point is we can't go back. It's hard. But if all we look at is time under the sun, time without God, and we ignore eternity, then we end up trying desperately to cope with nothing but losses our entire lives. You know what's going to happen if we're not careful? We're going to end up trying to hold on to things and we're going to hold onto them so tightly because we're afraid we're going to lose it that what we end up doing is we lose any real chance of enjoying those same things here and now. I'm talking about relationships. I'm talking about special moments. As we get older, maybe we become more aware of the fact that time is passing and we want to slow things down. And we want to savor the moments our entire industries about helping us savor moments. I wouldn't use the word hallmark at this moment, but I just thought I would throw that in there. We want to savor these things so much that we almost suffocate any hope of joy now because we're afraid that it's going to pass us by. But that's what we sign ourselves up for when all we see is life under the sun. And what that means is to see only life under the sun means that we are ignoring eternity. If I'm always worried about losing something or losing someone, I'll squeeze those moments to death. But when we realize that this world is not all that there is and that the end of our time here is just the beginning of forever, then we'll feel free to let time pass without feeling like we've lost something forever. And then we're free to enjoy the time that we have. About to give you one of my favorite quotes. Someone once said this, I think it's true, I don't know who wrote it, but he said this, death is less of an exit and more of an entrance. I like that. I really do. In other words, the passage of time gets us closer to home. A deep sense of belonging what home is. It's a deep sense of belonging that we can only experience in bits and pieces here and now. The passage of time gets us closer to where we are ultimately meant to be. When we get those incredible special moments with families and friends, and we're aware of how precious and how holy those moments are, we are tasting something that never has to end. The joys and the appetites of this life that God wants us to enjoy are just appetizers. It's a taste that the best is yet to come. That's something you ought to write down. The best is yet to come, and I mean that. So when we only look under the sun, that's the only time that we're looking at, it can be very depressing. But when we look at things from the vantage point of eternity, 
the moments that we've been holding on to so tightly, we can now just sort of relax and enjoy because it's not going to be the end of it. Knowing that whatever it is in this moment that's making us feel alive, alive, it is going to pass in the here and now, but that's not going to be the end of it. That's not going to be all of it. Thank you, dear. I'm so sorry. You skipped a page on me again. She puts my notes in the Bible for me. And I'm supposed to go through it every Sunday and make sure that they're all in the right order. So shame. Um, yes. Yeah, very much so. Not a one-person job. Boy, this is going to be an interesting Father's Day, isn't it? Yeah, and sure enough is. In Galatians 4, verse 4, the Apostle Paul writes these words. He says, but when the right time came, God sent his son. I like that. God's very much aware of the time that we have. God in Jesus began what I would call a great reversal. God operates so differently than we do, doesn't he? Absolutely. You see, in God's economy of time, death actually gives us life. Mourning gets turned into dancing. And the end of time, as we know it, is the beginning of eternity. The place where everything sad becomes untrue. I encourage some of you to read this book series uh, this summer. C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Some of you have read that in this particular book. C.S. Lewis puts it so beautifully, and you need to understand if you've not read the book, Aslan is a lion. He is the Christ figure in the book. Okay, And here's what C.S. Lewis writes. He says, wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roars, sorrows will be no more. When he bares his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. I think that's just incredible. See, the things that matter most to us will go on. So what is it that we experience in these moments that we want to hang on to? What is it that we want to savor? Maybe we're experiencing a peace or a contentedness or maybe an awareness of beauty. Maybe we are experiencing a sense of home or safety or joy. Regardless of what that experience might be, that's what makes us not want the moment to pass. And all those things that we've just talked about, those will now be our constant, interrupted, uninterrupted experience when time here, when time under the sun has come to an end. One more quote. And again, I don't know who actually wrote this one. I just found it in a book and decided I would share it with you. The writer says, hearts on earth say, in the course of a joyful experience, I don't ever want this to end. Can I guess that every one of us has made that comment at some time or another? Then he says, but invariably it does. The hearts of those in heaven say, I want this to go on forever. And it will. That is this passage in Ecclesiastes in a nutshell. This is us right now. So we are now free to enjoy all these things without feeling like we have to hold on to them and squeeze them or we're going to lose them forever. The things that matter the most will go on and on and on. In that sense, none of us has lost anything. This helps us deal with the sad of days gone by. Days we wish we could have back because whatever we felt then in those moments that we wish we could go back to, I got news for you. You're going to enjoy those moments more deeply and more colorfully and more fully than ever it was before. 
I believe, and I think these are pretty good words for us to end on, I believe God is winking at us right now. Can you let your imagination, just kind of like God, maybe you need to picture Jesus in your mind, but he's winking at us. And he says, just you wait. You think this is good? Just you wait. You haven't seen anything yet. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, for our closing prayer? Father in heaven, we've tried to do justice to your word again. I know your word can stand on its own, but you've given us this opportunity to think it through and to apply it in our own lives and to realize this life is not all that there is. You have put eternity in our hearts. Thank you for doing that. We're going to be figuring that out for a long time to come, what it really means. But it also means that we can let go of all the things we're trying to hold on to. Because truthfully, if we're your children, we're not really going to lose them anyway. Father, thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Let's go ahead and sing.